Okay, it's been a while since I filmed anything on the trailer here, but you can see we've got the locking mechanism all engineered. I just basically have to get those springs tensioned correctly. We've got a handle here. A little label cut out on the Lang mirror. Ramp up, ramp down. Got all the light plates in, all the way down. Up here, there, 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 there. Got the tie down hooks on the bottom, and it's all fully welded out. We've got all the hydraulic hose retainers in place, and we've got some wire loops. Zip tie the wire loom to that all the way up. So, time to pressure wash, go quality control on all the welds, and if it's good, then we paint. You know, if you've got a big job like this to degrease, it's a really big hassle to wipe the whole thing down. And I've personally had extremely good luck using cheap dishwashing soap like this from the dollar store, along with something like Simple Green or Purple Power, like this product, which are very cheap by the gallon also. And I just put those in this Hudson sprayer, spray down whatever the object might be, and then hit it with a really high quality pressure washer. So today we're going to be painting this trailer. I'm going to be hitting it with some primer and then a top coat. It's kind of a unique situation because there is some repurposed steel on here. Some of this stuff already has a primer coat on it. Some of it has some paint on it. Some of it is raw and new. So it's kind of a unique situation. And so what I'm going to be doing just to, just to keep this project under budget I'm going to be taking a bunch of my remnant rust-oleum, some of the off colors, dumping them in with my primer coat, and then I'll come over with my top coat, which is going to be a black. And that's going to stretch the paint a little bit further. It's a good way to get rid of those partial cans of paint that seem to just kind of hang around. And it's going to give us the maximum amount of material to spray on this trailer, which is going to give us the maximum amount of protection it's a win-win. Okay, look at this. Look at this random assortment here. We have a little bit of yellow, a little bit of black. I think I got some gray here. I've got a little bit of a blue, blue gunmetal gray. I've got a bunch of parcels of black in varying gloss types. So this is going to be mayhem, but this is exactly why we keep those partial cans around for projects like this, where we need good, thick undercoating primer coating, base coating, before we lay our color on. So we're going to use all these up, no money wasted. We're going to come in under budget on this project. Okay, first things first, I happen to have a two gallon bucket, which is going to be absolutely perfect. Um, I've got my cordless drill and tip number one, you know, dollar store whisk. It's going to be a lifesaver. It's going to make this job a lot easier. Let's start popping lids and dumping some paint in here. We'll see what kind of crazy color we come up with. Now this is something that you probably wouldn't want to do on a top coat unless it was a one-time type of deal. Something like this is like 99% impossible to match unless you write your formula down. So probably prime coat only. But yeah, what a, what a great way to not have to waste paint. 
Now another thing to keep in mind is brand compatibility. These are all Rust-Oleum. I don't, I have one can that's off brand. I don't have any qualms about dumping that in because I am 100% certain that these are all alkyde enamels, oil based, which is kind of a, a certain type of chemical composition that falls under the big umbrella that is oil based. Alkyde enamel. Readily available, durable, great for industrial applications. Not only that, but with Rust-Oleum you have the huge benefits of spraying it in bulk, possibly scratching it up at some point, and being able to touch up with a rattle can. All right, look at this one. This was a partial can. It was probably about a fifth of the way full, quarter of the way full. Caved in edge, didn't quite seal right. Check it out. Gelled up, dried. But we might be able to mix that in. We're pouring through a filter, so it's worth a shot. Another thing to bear in mind, you definitely want to scrape the bottom of these cans if they're older, if they've been sitting a while. A lot of the pigments and the solids that you'll need are going to settle out to the bottom. You'll want to scrape those out, mix them in, and really resuspend them throughout the composition. Uh, look at that. You don't want that going in there. Okay, we'll get this mixed up. One thing to note, I will not be thinning this or adding any type of activator into it while it's in bulk. I'll be doing that separately once I'm mixing by the cup, spray cup. You know an old painter once taught me a trick. He said, hold your mixer at 45 degrees to your product. He said, otherwise what's happening is you're spinning everything at their respective layers and they're not mixing top to bottom. He said, when you hold it at 45 degrees, you're forcing a thorough mixing throughout the entire bucket. Okay, our magic number for today is going to be four parts paint. We're going to bump our, we're going to cut back on our solvent a tiny bit because we're going to be using the siphon feed gun, which means it'll handle a little bit heavier of a material. And instead of activating the primer coat, the base coat, we're going to be just adding in a little bit of Japan dryer. It's technically activating it, it's just that it's not, we're not using a catalyst, a hardener. We're using Japan Dryer, which is salt based. It's still going to kick it off very quick. It's going to allow us to recoat rapidly, but it's not going to add any gloss or any hardness. So we're going to go four, one and a half, and then we're going to add in one cap full of Japan Dryer. All right, if that's not thin quite enough, we can do a little bit of additional thinning while it's already in the cup. Always pour through a filter. Can't emphasize that one enough. That's going to save you a world of heartache. See all that scuzz? That would have ended up in the paint gun. It would have clogged the tip and it would have called it, caused us all kinds of problems. Okay, filter respirator is a must. Always cover your unsprayed product. Also a must. All right, now we've got our top coat here. I used a gloss black and kind of a grayish color. Now as I mentioned, if you're doing this as a top coat, 
you really want to make a notation of your mix ratios. This is plenty of paint for me to get through this trailer. In fact, I might even have some left over. And by the time I need to worry about repainting this trailer again, this type of paint's probably going to be illegal anyway. So the current task at hand is to wire up the back of this trailer. We've got the three lights that turn on with the running lights in the center of this trailer and then we've got the two strip LEDs on each side that are stop, turn and running light. We'll start here, go to the center of the light with our three, leave ourselves a tiny bit of slack and we're going to kind of run this through to here and then I'm just going to make little sharpie mark behind each light about where it's going to fall. So just marking these wires. Alright, we've got our piece of chase rod here, a couple of pieces of TIG wire. If I was pulling through a really tight area, I would stagger these wires, but this is basically an inch and a half by inch and a half on the inside. I think what's holding us up from being able to just push the wires through is those little slugs that I cut out for the lights. Easy as pie. So we're just going to fish that out. Alright, there's our first one. Right there. And we need the brown. I'm using these connectors. I have the solder and the heat streak tube built in. I wasn't really sure what to think of these things, and then I, I keep seeing all these people using them and talking about how great they are. I thought, you know, this is a perfect place to try them out. It's a personal project. And it's a trailer. It's not like inside of a vehicle or anything like that. So if anything did short out, it's not real, a real big hazard. So yeah, I thought I'd give them a shot. You know, this, this is about the fourth connection I've done and I'm fairly impressed with them. Now you're supposed to use a heat shrink gun, but I don't have one, I mean a heat gun. I don't have a heat gun. So I've been using the torch and I just keep it moving and it's been working pretty well. Once these things kind of cool down, they get kind of an opaque color. But man, I was pulling on them and they are really in there. They do grab pretty pretty darn well. Alright, let's check and see how these are working. It's, like, it's nice to check as you progressively work. Just make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, you know what works perfect for this is a cordless tool battery. This is an 18 volt and it's not fully charged which means we're not quite at 18 volts. These are 12 volt lights. It'll work perfect. Pretty sharp.
All right, we've got to punch a hole for this hydraulic to go through. And it's got to drop down and then run to the back of the trailer. I think I'm going to drop down over here. And that's going to clear up the maximum amount of room for a potential winch in this area at some point. Or I punch through right here, and then when I do the winch, I can re plumb to over here. This trailer is too big to fit in my shop. You gotta work out here in the dark. Now that hydraulic unit, head unit, is rated for load holding. But you know if those hydraulics ever develop any leak or anything like that, then your rating just goes away. So this is the emergency lock or the safety lock, whatever you want to call it here. Just the manual lock. I got these hydraulic hose retainers here. The two pieces of rubber and they're held in place by two bolts and a little metal plate. They're uh, really ideal. And I just welded those on every 24 inches. And it's actually a really nice day today. So the key is to leave a tiny bit of slack in these things, in this hose. Because on a cold day, it's gonna really restrict constrict all right we've got to make up some battery cables here so this is just some 8 gauge wire I've got two of them twisted together into this terminal here one of them goes to the battery, one of them goes to a grounding block on the frame. So this side will mount on our power unit. What I've got is a little bit of flux on this wire to clean it. I've got the terminal upside down to act as a cut. I've got my heat shrink tubing moved far enough away that it's not going to get melted. Now what we're going to do is direct all of our heat onto this terminal. We're going to fill that thing up like a cut with our solder. There you have it. Just what the doctor ordered and this is the smallest heat shrink tubing I had that would fit over this terminal but I think it's still a little bit too big. Let's see what we can do here. Keep that flame moving. You know, with the ground, it's definitely not as crucial to cover it as it is with the positive terminal. But it, it definitely makes your job look a little bit neater, your work. Okay, that one's hardened up enough, that's not gonna fall off. Go to our next one here. So same thing, the wire goes into the flex. That's going to clean our wire so that we can get a good connection. And I'm actually going to fold this over. I've already got the heat shrink tubing on there. Nice snug fit. Same thing. Treat it like a cup. And you know, I've got this clamp here. If this 
tries to fall out or tries to hang or make that angle awkward, you can just clamp it to where it, it looks about right, something like that. Okay, same thing, all of our heat gets directed onto our terminal. You can see that flux start to bubble. That means you're ready for solder. Just feed that solder in until it spills over the edge. And then you know it's full right there. Give a little tiny bit more to top it off. There it is. Okay, heat shrink tubing. Let that cool a little bit. It's still possible to pull that wire out. As long as that flux is, I mean that solder is liquid, you can pull it out. egg that one out a little bit with a drill bit. When you have to do that on these, the key is to not put the next size up drill bit in here. It's put a small drill bit and work your way around. Otherwise it just grabs and it yanks it and bends it all up. A little trick I like to do, especially when you're using small gauge wires like this into a terminal or a fuse block or whatever you're putting together, you know, if you if you imagine that terminal trying to pinch that little wire, you might not get that great of a purchase on it, but if you double that wire over like that, you know, cut them a little bit long, strip them back a little bit long, twist them up, and then fold them over. That gives you a lot better of a grab on there. And it's really almost a necessity when you have two different gauge wires like this. So these are both grounds. This is a heavier gauge wire than this. You almost have to, by necessity, double that smaller gauge. Otherwise you get an uneven clamp. And then that one, the smaller gauge is always going to be loose. So now if you look here in a situation like this, you have this really heavy, heavy ground and I want to ground this trailer to my battery that runs the hydraulic unit also. So I've got these two different wires, drastically different gauges. Let's do this. Let's divide a little bit of this one here and let's add the rest over here. And that's going to give us two that are approximately the same size. <laughs> 